I think I can talk about now is closed door gathering. You weren't meant to describe. Hope you it. don't get sued by this. Yeah, one too. that's right. I'm really opening myself <laughs> here. Uh, and um, and uh, I thought it, it was it was sci- it was called Science and the Spiritual Quest. And it was a bunch of scientists that were being brought together. And I thought it was going to be an interesting but ultimately one-note meeting. I thought everybody's going to basically say the same thing. There could be a God. There's no evidence for a God. We've got the laws of physics. And we're going to just press forward under the assumption that physics is all there is until the clouds part and God reveals him or herself or itself to us. And at that point, we may change our tune. It was not one note. I was the only person who had that perspective in the room. Everybody else was coming at religion from a very different way of thinking about the world. In fact, there's one Nobel laureate in the room who got up and sang psalms as part of his presentation. And I was sitting there and I was like, what is happening here? This is so unexpected to me. And what it really meant was I was so close-minded into the varieties of religious engagement that happen in the world. And it opened my eyes. And there's one Nobel Lord in particular, I did say to him at the end, I said, when you look at me and you hear my view, what do you think? And he kind of put his arm around me in an avuncular way and said, you know, you're, you're a real smart guy and uh, you don't understand the true reality. And um, I think ultimately you will because you're open-minded and you're on a journey and I hope that your journey will finally take you to the place where I have been for, for many years. However, another answer is that the very question may not make as much sense as the words seem to suggest. We know how to parse that sentence. We know what it means to talk about the moment before the Big Bang because we know how to talk about the moment before your birth or the moment before the Civil War or the moment before any event that happened in the world. We fully understand the meaning of that kind of sentence. But it could be that when it comes to the Big Bang, the sentence actually doesn't mean anything. It could be that the Big Bang was the place where time itself started. And uh, Hawking himself had a wonderful analogy to get this across. He said, look, I'll dress it up a little bit. Imagine you're walking on planet Earth and you pass by someone and you say, hey, can you point me in the direction of north? I want to walk in the northward direction. They point you, continue to walk, you pass by somebody else, say, hey, which way is further north? And they point you in that direction. But when you get to the North Pole and talk to somebody there and say, hey, how do I go further north? They look at you and say, whoa, That question doesn't mean anything because this is where north begins. There's no notion of going further north than the North Pole. And it could be that that spatial metaphor applies to time. Talk about a billion years ago or 10 billion years ago, but if you go to 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang, that may be where time started. And you can't go further back in time than the very origin of time itself. But I was saying to him, there are times I go around the world and I will do things that are utterly irrational. I'll knock on wood for good luck. I'll speak to my dead father. I know that he's not really there. I'll pray to God on occasion if I think that I could use that backup. Not because I think there's some bearded individual in the sky. It's just a behavioral tendency that I find to be comforting and useful. And I said this to Richard. And he said, I totally get it. I was like, what? He was like, I totally get it. He said, he said, in fact, he said, I don't like to sleep in a house that has a reputation as being haunted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and, and, and for me, it was such a beautiful human moment. It was such a beautiful human moment where we were just like being human beings. Right. And, and he said, and then he said, we're both sinners. And I agree. We are yeah. both sinners in that sense <laughs> because we know how the world works. We know this doesn't make any sense. And yes, it's still part of somehow uh, how we behave in the world. What also is a heavy one is what caused the Big Bang? Yeah. Like why would something smaller than the head of a pin yeah. become everything that we see in the cosmos? Yeah. So there are ideas for the answer to that question. Look, all of this is tentative right. because it's very hard to do measurements that go all the way back to the beginning. We have astronomical observations that we need to be sure are compatible with the predictions of our theories and so forth. So, so we as good scientists do what needs to be done to try to test these ideas. But the idea that I think most physicists or cosmologists buy into at the moment is that gravity can have two manifestations. The usual form of gravity that you and I know about is the attractive version. You drop something toward the Earth and it moves downward because the Earth and the object pull on each other. That's the ordinary gravity that we experience every day of our lives. But Einstein's equations actually allow gravity to also be repulsive. It can push outward 
as opposed to just pulling inward. And this is something that we have never experienced because the gravity created by a rocky object like the Earth is always the attractive variety. The gravity created by the sun, again, a compact object is always the attractive variety. But Einstein's math shows that if you don't have a, a rocky object that's isolated in space, but rather energy that is uniformly spread through a region of space, that that kind of entity yields repulsive gravity. Why is that important to your question? If the very early universe, that little tiny head of a pin that you're talking about, if it was filled with a uniform bath of this energy, we call it the inflaton field, the name doesn't matter, but if it was filled with that energy, it would have been subject to repulsive gravity. What does repulsive gravity do? Pushes everything apart, causes everything to rush outward. So the bang of the Big Bang may have been a spark of repulsive gravity operating with a tiny region of space that pushed everything apart. I think it's the latter group that ultimately would triumph because with that kind of freedom of thought, you get novelty, yes. you get ingenuity, you get creativity. And so I feel as though this is part and parcel of who we are and why we have survived. And to sort of come at the world with a, a scientific club, you know, so, so you can have this uh, cosmological pre-show, you can have it last as long as you like. The only thing that you need to happen is that sooner or later, a region flattens out, and then the cosmological show begins. Yeah. Or, you know, there are folks who basically say that there are qualities of the human brain that naturally leave it open to a religious sensibility. Yes. I mean, for instance, we have agency detection systems in our brain where we look around the world and we tend to assign agency to things that happen. That's mm -hmm. useful, right? Yeah. Because, you know, if you mistake a windblown branch for a jaguar, yeah, it's fine. You thought it was a jaguar, but it's just a branch. But if the reverse happens, you think it you, you know, <laughs> was a jaguar and you think it's a windblown branch, you're going to get eaten. Yeah. So we tend to over-endow agency into the world. There is evolutionary value to that. So when the wind blows, we tend to think there's a mind up there. When the river gurgles, we tend to think that there's a mind in there. Yeah. And this is sort of the seed for the kinds of perspectives that you find in many of the world's religions. So there's there's natural course of events that can lead to uh, the arising of the institution, or at least the ideas behind the institution of religion. And for students that have never encountered that idea before, and it could be, it could be that time is an emergent quality of reality. i give you an analogy, boy, what I mean by that is we all know what temperature means intuitively. Something's hot, you feel it. Something's cold, you feel it. Your body understands those concepts. What physics has done is it's gone deeper into the concept of temperature and revealed that it is nothing but the average motion of the particles making up the environment. So if the molecules are moving really quickly, you've got a hot environment. If the molecules are really moving slowly, it's a cold environment. So temperature emerges from the motion of particles. So if you have like one particle, you can't really talk about it being hot or cold because you need a conglomerate. You need an agglomeration of particles to be able to talk about their average motion. And in that sense, temperature is this emergent idea that rests upon more fundamental ideas, the molecules and atoms that make up reality. Maybe that's true of time. Maybe time as we know it is a property that only makes sense in certain environments when there's enough stuff arranged in the right patterns. But fundamentally, maybe there are atoms or molecules of time, which when not arranged in the form that we are familiar with, don't yield time as we know it. Time itself may be a quality of the world that exists here in this environment, but doesn't even apply in other environments that are configured radically differently. We had a nice weekend, and by the time I got back to Cambridge on the bus, my mom called me and said, Dad's dead. It was so, so shocking. It was like so sudden. It was so complete. And I remember I went back home, and my dad was not a religious man, but we knew that he would want to have a religious ceremony, and, and, we, and we did it. And we had, you know, a minion of Jews coming to the house to recite the, the Kaddish prayer because we weren't religious. We didn't know what we were doing, you know. And I had no idea what these men were saying. But it was deeply comforting. 
In fact, I didn't want to know what they were saying. To me, it was just a collection of ancient sounds. But the sounds connected me across the generations to a culture that had been extending back 5,000 years. And in a moment of crisis, that was a very comforting and useful connection to have. Yeah, that, that, that is where I find people get the most out of religion in, in the fact that it brings communities together in this sort of uh, cohesive ritual where yeah. everybody acts together and everybody, you feel like there's completion to it. Yeah. Like you're putting someone, you know, you're yeah. putting someone into perspective and you're doing so with this religious ceremony. And, and when large groups of people get together and engage in a ritual behavior, something magical happens. You know, yeah. I've spoken to evolutionary psychologists like Steve Pinker, who is a wonderful thinker. I've had him in here too. Yeah, okay. And, and, you know, Steve is skeptical that this kind of ritual behavior can yield the kind of cohesive bonding that some people suggest that it does. But, you know, you probably have, but I have on occasion engaged in these ritual behaviors, you know, mass drumming and movement, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and, and I got to tell you, you are quickly, I find, transported to a place where you are now part of a collective yeah. and you feel yourself melting into the group and you are one. And if you've never had that experience, I think it's something that you should have because I think it's a vital part of our heritage. It is part of how we got to be who we are. Yeah, and in fact, this so-called inflationary cosmology is the technical name for the subject, says that. It says that it's quite likely that this explosive inflation of the region that we currently inhabit, it was just one of many such events. And therefore, there are other far-flung regions throughout this larger cosmological landscape where things have also inflated, but the details can be different. The physical details can differ from what we are familiar with. And the differences can be small, temperature differences in one part of space versus another, or they can be far more significant. Even the the particles that make up that other realm may be different from the particles that make up our realm. Their masses can be different. Their charges can be different. Their fundamental physical features can be different. So out there in that wider cosmological landscape, it can be the wild, wild west of realities. And they don't have to worry about proton deterioration. There may be realms in which they don't have to worry about protons falling apart. Um, uh, the wild, the really crazy idea is that if you're very careful mathematically in analyzing these theories, you realize that there have to be realms out there that duplicate ours as well. Many can be different, but there have to be versions of this reality that are also instantiated, occur out there in yeah. other realms. So you come to these crazy sounding, sci-fi sounding ideas that you and I are having this conversation out there in other distant realms. An infinite number of times. Perhaps infinite number of times. And moreover, yeah. small differences can also arise in these other realms where maybe our positions are interchanged at the table or, you know, maybe your name is, uh, you know, Joe Green and I'm Brian Rogan or there's like strange realities that can be taking place. And this is not an overworked theorist imagination. This is the careful, dispassionate analysis of the mathematical equations. Now, I should say, there are some physicists who see this implication and say, whoa, you guys have fallen off the deep end. Your theory has imploded because any theory that predicts that kind of a wealth of realities that are kind of untestable because they're so far away that we will never interact with them, that's the kind of theory that we have been trained to avoid, to excise. Mm. However, the more you know, forward thinking I'd like to describe us, physicists say, hey, uh, math has proven to be a very valuable guide over the course of hundreds of years. And if this is where the math is taking us, it's at least worthy of our attention to investigate it fully and possibly come to the conclusion that this is how reality actually behaves. Because the point that I make there is that to truly engage with the world, you have to use a variety of stories. We're fundamentally storytellers. That's what human beings are. Now, there's the reductionist story that physicists are well-equipped to talk about with particles and laws of physics. 
On top of that, you've got the chemist story, the complex molecules. You've got the biologist story that begins to talk about cells and life. You've got the psychological story, the neurophysiological story that brings in mind and consciousness. And within that, you then have all of the activities that conscious beings undertake, which includes religion and includes telling other kinds of stories and includes creative expression. You need them all. And to sort of say that the scientific account is the only account by which you're ever going to gain true qualities of the world is a very, in my view, limited description of what truth is. There is objective truth in the world that we can measure, that we can describe with equations of so forth, but there's also internal truth, spiritual truth that you get to by self-examination. It's real in the sense that you're understanding how you respond to the world. And that is something which is deeply personal, but utterly real. And whether it's through psychedelics, whether it's through ayahuasca, whether it's through a spiritual journey, whether it's through religion, regardless, all of this adds color to the story of what it means to be a human being.